Hello! So in that last video, we talked a little bit about the course logistics. Uh, now I actually want to talk about some uh, real content, and in particular, take a look at what it means to write reproducible code. <clears throat> um, let's look back at the last um, course, um, CS301 or 220. Uh, and in that one, people would submit projects, and at the end of the semester, I had this form that people could fill if they thought that um, there was like issues with one of their projects. And, and so this was showing how many issues people had across each of them. And you see that project nine uh, was by far the most problematic. And, and maybe some of you had um, issues with that when you took that course. And so I want you to think back, if you had any issues, what was tricky about that one? Um, the trouble a lot of people had was with dealing with files. Um, in, in particular, um, when you're trying to open up a file inside of a directory, you have to have slashes in your file path. Is it a forward slash? Is it a backslash? Well, that depends. Are you on Windows or Mac? And so if you didn't get that quite right, it was very easy to have code that would work for you, uh, but not for anybody else um, running it, right? It's, it's easy to get code that's not reproducible. Um, if you Google reproducibility, here's one definition. Um, reproducibility is to the extent uh, to which results are obtained when an experiment is repeated. So I want you to think about what does it mean for reprodu reproducible results for a data scientist? Um, it means that if somebody else runs your code, uh, they're going to see what you had done. If it worked for you, it's going to work for them, and they're going to get any sort of numeric answers. Um, if they, Whatever answers they get ought to be the same as what you got. Right? So this is one of our new goals. How can we um, uh, write reproducible code? And there's a lot of details about both hardware and operating systems and packages that we have to learn about to think about how we can write reproducible code. And so there's a bunch of new terms. Well, some of them are new. That we're going to be thinking about today and that i'm going to be defining and, and so i actually want you to just take a moment and pause the video and write down which of these terms you already think you know a good key to learning is to be able to kind of cleanly divide between what you already know and what you still need to learn so pause me and after you come back uh, we'll dive in and learn some of these uh some of these new ideas okay so again the big question today will my program run on somebody else's computer and produce the same results. And we're gonna start very general. We're not even gonna assume that this program is written in, in Python. So for this to work, there's a few things that have to match. Um, the hardware, well, if the hardware is similar, that's trying to help, we're gonna think about how we can deal with having different people have different hardware. Um, you have to worry about the operating system, right? What if I'm running on Windows and, and you have a Mac? And I'm gonna talk about both those things today. And then for the next lecture, we're gonna talk about dependencies. So starting with hardware, there's two types of hardware we really have to understand um, as kind of a starting point, and that's RAM, or memory, and the CPU. And we've talked about these before, but we're going to go much deeper now. Uh, here's the mental model that I want you to have for RAM, or memory. Uh, say that each running program on your computer has one giant list, and anything to do with that program has to be inside of that, that list. And actually, I'm going to start using a new word here. When I'm talking about running programs, there's a name for that. That's a process. Um, it's possible that I could write one program um, and open up two uh, terminals and run it the same program in both terminals at the same time, and then I'd have two processes for that same program. And each of these processes would have this, this giant list. And, and inside of this giant list, uh, we have these values called bytes. And a byte is just an integer that's between 0 and 255. So this is what every running process gets in the world. And you should be a little bit suspicious, right? Because you've written programs and you've run them, and you know you have so much more. You've maybe created programs that have two lists, or maybe have numbers bigger than 255. And, and so there's this kind of uh, tension, right? If I have this kind of simple one big list with only these small integers in it, how can I do all these other things that you know programs can do? Like how can I have multiple lists? Um, how can I have you know, multiple variables referencing the same object? How can I have strings, right? Instead of just these numbers. And well, the really kind of mind bender is that the code for our program itself also has to end up in that list, right? So how, how can all these things be in the state of the program represented as this one giant uh, uh, list? Well, uh, Let's think about this. Let's start with having multiple lists. How could you deal with having multiple lists in it? Well, one thing you could do is you could carve up your big list and say, okay, well, I want to have one list that has three and 20 in it. 
And um, I can put that anywhere inside of the bigger list. I could say that this list is going to start at, at, at position eight. And then I could have this other list, 11, 22, 33. And I could have that start somewhere else. I put that at, at, at 12, at position 12. Um, so these numbers, eight and 12, uh, are, well, they're indexes to us, right, in terms of list terminology. But when we're talking about this big list that, um, that a running process has, uh, we're going to call those addresses, which is kind of a address index, really kind of the same idea, right? So those are addresses. And this big list, I'm actually giving it a name now. Uh, the whole big list is called an address space, right? So every running process has an address space. And if you have an address, then you can find data in it. Maybe you can find one of these smaller, smaller lists, right? This is what's really happening. We have a running program. This happens with, with every Python program that you've ever run what's happening inside. Now, we're gonna eventually learn about these details that mean you don't have to think about this, but this is what's happening for your programs. So this is gonna have some implications for performance, which is why I wanna think about these nitty gritty details. Um, let's say that I want to append the value 44 uh, to that second list. It turns out that that's gonna be a really fast thing to do because there's a spot open in there and I just try to put that number um, in the open spot. Now, now, what if I wanted to say list two dot pop zero? Uh, well, let's just remember what does this do? So pop is removing an item, and it's removing the item at index zero. So we're trying to remove eleven, right? So eleven is trying to go away. And since we already said that this list starts at twelve, what that means is that all these values have to move over, right? Twenty two has to move into spot twelve. Thirty three has to move into spot thirteen and so on and, and so forth and so that's actually a pretty slow operation and as the list gets bigger and bigger it gets slower and slower to remove things from the from the beginning right and we can do experiments to see that but but this is why right uh, this is why it's slower and so there's a couple of things i may want to be teaching in, in kind of upcoming lectures one how can we actually measure this and see this happening right see that it's slower and, and then two we want to have some sort of notation we're talking about what is fast or slow, right? I mean, appending is fast, hopping from the beginning is slow, uh, but there's kind of a whole range of what's fast and slow, and we want to be able to reason about it uh, a little bit more uh, rigorously, right? We want to do it too theoretical, but at least a little bit. Okay, so that was two lists inside of the big list. Um, another challenge, how can I have both variables and references? So, so I'm kind of thinking in terms of this code down here, right, that you can see in Python Tutor. Um, x equals some list, y equals x. And then on the right, you know what that will look like, right? I mean, have x and y are two references to that same list. How do we do this if we just have one giant list? Uh, it's actually not too hard. So I have that uh, list with three and 20. I've added position eight. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use other positions in the list uh, for my variables. And inside of those variables, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put an address, right? So Maybe I'll have the x variable at position three, and, uh, and that contains eight, which refers to that list. The y variable is at position five, that also contains eight. And that's how I can represent that I have multiple variables that are referencing uh, the same piece of data. Third challenge, right? I mean, programs are kind of boring if they just have numbers. How can I get some strings? And the answer is that we're going to use encodings or encoding tables you, you've seen encodings a little bit maybe you remember that if you open a file you say something like open file.txt encoding equals utf-8 so utf-8 is an example of an encoding and an encoding is just like a big table like the one i'm shown here this is not the utf encoding but but it's some encoding and basically what we're going to do is we're going to say well each letter gets a number and so here 67 65 66 those correspond to three letters. And I'm just gonna have you pause for a moment and uh, and before you continue, figure out what string is there. So pause me, figure out what string is there, maybe write it down and we'll resume. And well, 67 is C, 65 is A, and 66 is B, so I guess we have cab, right? So, so there's all these tricks, right? Um, even though I only can really store these bytes, I can use that to ultimately store strings. Okay, this is the trickiest one of all. How can we put code inside of a giant list? Okay, so, so for the example I'm gonna go with here, I have some sort of while loop, and inside of the while loop I say i plus equals two, something like that. 
what we're going to do is we're going to have something a lot like the encoding table for strings. Uh, but now what we're going to be doing is instead of having a letter for each number, we'll have some sort of operation for each number. Um, so for example, maybe um, I'll say that five means I should add, uh, eight means that I should subtract. Okay, so instead of an encoding table, we're going to call this one with all these operations an instruction set. Okay, and so kind of looking at this code up here, I see five means add, and then there's a two right after that. So that's that five two, that's that i plus equals two part. Um, 33, eight. Well, what, what is that? So 33 means jump, jump to position eight, right? So, so what that is actually doing is drawing it back to the top of the loop. So the way this is going to work is that when I have a CPU, uh, the CPU is running and the CPU keeps track of well, what part of the code are we currently on. And, um, and it does that with something called the instruction pointer, which I'll often draw as a little red arrow. And, um, and this is actually pretty similar to something we've seen in Python Tutor, right? In the bottom left, I have some Python Tutor code and the red arrow points to what we're currently doing. Um, in the same way, a CPU has this instruction pointer that points to something in the big list, which is the code that we're currently currently running. So it's there. And, and normally, right, as, as the program's running, the CPU will move forward. Sorry, maybe so it moves here, and then it says, oh, I need to add two to my variable. And then it goes to the next part, and it says, oh, I need to go back to the top of the loop, right? So I'm gonna jump back here. Right, so the CPU knows how to, A, kind of keep track of what, uh, what code it's currently running, and then B, it has this instruction set inside of the CPU, so it knows which numbers mean which operations it should perform. Right, so that's how a CPU works, right? It, and I'll try to point to these things and then run them. It knows how to interpret them. Okay. How does this all relate back to reproducibility? Uh, how can I make sure my code on my computer runs the same for you? And so what I want you to imagine here is this problem where you and I bought different kinds of CPUs. And by different kinds, I mean they have different instruction sets. And on my CPU, five means that I want to add a number. And on your CPU, five means that you want to subtract something. Okay? Uh, if we try to run this code on your computer, uh, different things could happen. One, you could be subtracting when you're supposed to be adding and just trying to get weird results. Um, or more likely, uh, it just won't run at all, right? On, on my computer, 33 means jump. On yours, it doesn't mean anything. So maybe the program just crashes, right? So in general, right, code that's written for one specific CPU does not work for other CPUs. The program code and the CPU need to fit, right? I've kind of drawn this with different shapes, right? I have program A, that's CPU X, program B fits CPU Y. If I mix and match it, I'm gonna you know, get something weird or more likely it won't even run. Okay, well, you've been writing a lot of programs and not worrying about this. How is it that this has not been a problem for you before, right? Why haven't we noticed this? And the answer is something called the interpreter. So on your computer, right, when you install Python, Right, and you want to run a program, you say Python base and then the program name. And, and what you're really doing is you're kind of running two programs at the same time. You're running this python.exe, that's a program, that's a Python executable. And you're also running your, your, your own program, right? So the python.exe is an interpreter and its job is to read Python code and then run it on, on the CPU that's currently in, in use. And this makes it very easy to run our Python code on different computers because what we'll do is if I have, you know, CPU X, I may have one version of the Python.exe on my computer. You have a different CPU, you're going to have a slightly different version of the Python.exe that understands how to have instructions for that. And, and so I can, it kind of like level, levels the field, right? I can put this program.py, this regular Python code, on top of these different interpreters, each built for a custom CPU, and I can run it anywhere. Right, so we have different CPUs, different interpreters, but the same same program. And and so when I do that, when I take my program and I run it on somebody else's computer, I might say that I'm I'm kind of porting it. Right, the code is portable; it can run anywhere. Right, Maybe thanks to this kind of Python interpreter that translates my Python code into something the CPU understands. Right, like that 
you know, the, the interpreter will be the part that understands that five means add, right? So it can translate my Python code into whatever the CPU wants. Okay. There's other tools that do, do this. Um, uh, for example, a compiler. A compiler kind of does this once and produces a new program built for that CPU. Interpreters just do this as you're running, which is a little bit slower, uh, but maybe also more convenient in some ways. So here's something I want you to ponder, and feel free to pause if that makes sense. Think about this. But if all CPUs in the world have the same instruction set, well, if there's only one kind of CPU, basically, would there be any value in having a Python interpreter? Right? Well, so we've seen the one value, right? A Python interpreters are great when we have different CPU instruction sets, but what if they were all the same? Is there still any value in that? And the answer is yes, there is, right? Because in addition to this reproducibility issue, uh, it's also a pain to write code directly for a CPU, right? I don't want to have to remember as a programmer that five means add and 33 means jump or anything like that, right? Python code is easy to run. And so the Python interpreter is not only kind of bridging this gap, but, um, but it's kind of meaning I don't have to remember all these things, right? It's able to translate the easy to write code into something more complicated that the CPU um, understands. The hardware, hardware is very important to reproducibility and the, the Python interpreter kind of helps us uh, deal with this. I'm gonna stop this video there and next we're gonna talk about um, operating systems and how they are going to be relevant.